In this video, I do a set of scientific tests on the Amazfit GTR3. First, I test the quality of the sleep tracking against an EEG monitor. Second, I'll check the heart rate accuracy. Third, I'll take a look at the SpO2 or oxygen saturation measurements. And finally, I'll check out the GPS accuracy. Hello everyone, for those of you that are new to the channel, my name is Rob and I'm a postdoctoral scientist specializing in biological data analysis. As we've seen in previous videos, Amazfit watches have not performed well in many of my tests, especially when it comes to heart rate tracking during exercise. In this video, I take a first scientific look at the much anticipated Amazfit GTR3. Many of my viewers have commented that it might perform better at heart rate tracking than the watches that came before, so let's start off with the heart rate tracking. I'll compare the Amazfit GTR3 to the Polar H10 ECG chest strap, which is generally considered one of the most accurate consumer devices available for heart rate measurements. Let's start off with the accuracy during spinning. Here I displayed an overview of the heart rate accuracy during two spinning sessions. Each dot is a single heart rate measurement with along the horizontal axis the value according to the Polar H10 ECG chest strap and along the vertical axis the value according to the Amaze for GTR3. The blue line indicates perfect agreement, so any measurement along the blue line had roughly the same value for the Polar H10 and the GTR3. The more measurements there are in a certain area, the darker black the color. As you can see, the Amazfit GTR3 shows some agreement with the Polar H10 ECG chest strap, as there are some points along the blue line. However, there are also quite a few points close to this red line. The red line indicates those measurements where the heart rate according to the Amazfit GTR3 is half of the actual heart rate. This means that the GTR3 quite often detected a too low heart rate. Let's take a look at the individual training sessions to see what can explain this. Here we see the first spinning session. Along the horizontal axis we have the clock time and my heart rate is along the vertical axis. In blue I plotted my heart rate according to the Polar H10 ECG chest strap and in red is my heart rate according to the Amazfit GTR3. I took five short breaks where my heart rate would dip as you can see in these moments. What we see is that quite often a GTR3 would not pick up on my increase in heart rate after taking a break, but instead it would keep recording a lower heart rate. This is true for three out of the six segments. For this second spinning session right here, we see the exact same thing. It quite often kept detecting a too low heart rate after I took a break, and this was true for more than half of my workout. So far, this is not looking great for the Amazfit GTR3. However, let's now take a look at some different types of exercise. For instance, the accuracy during biking. Many devices I've tested really struggle with this as it involves much more shaking of the arm. Here I've displayed that accuracy and it's actually looking slightly better than what we saw during spinning. As you can see there are still quite a few points away from the blue line, however there appear to be fewer points really far away. Let's look at some of the individual bike rides to see how well it actually did. Here we see the first bike ride, again in blue is the ECG chest strap and in red the GTR3. As you can see, even though both are roughly in the same range of values, the agreement is not great. The red line does not really follow the blue one. And we see the same for this second bike ride. Both devices don't agree very well. Interestingly, for this third bike ride, the agreement is much better. I would say it's actually quite good. I have no real explanation for why it performed differently. In all cases, they were running on the same firmware version, so this cannot be the reason. What could have happened is that for this last ride, the watch might have been exceptionally high on my wrist. Normally, I wear these watches as high and tight as is generally recommended, but but during this ride I was also wearing the Fitbit Charge 5 so I put the GTR3 slightly higher on my wrist. During bike rides the GTR3 did not perform great except during my last ride so this definitely deserves some extra testing. Finally let's take a look at two weightlifting sessions. Weightlifting is one of the hardest things for a watch to track accurately since there's much more tension on my arm and on my wrist. Here we see mediocre agreement between the GTR3 and the ECG chest strap. There are some points along the blue line but there's also quite a few points away from the blue line. And if we look at the individual training sessions, we can see why. The Amaze for GTR3 can follow the general trend in my heart rate. However, each time I do a set of exercises, my arm tenses and it's not able to pick up on my increased heart rate. And we see the same thing for this second session. Interestingly, it also detected a super high heart rate for a while. While my heart rate was lower than 120 BPM, it recorded a heart rate of up to 180 BPM. Overall, this is not looking great for the Amaze for GTR3. However, let's see if it does any better at sleep tracking. For the sleep comparison, I wore the Amazfit GTR3 to bed for two nights and at the same time I also wore this EEG device called the Dream2 headband and finally I recorded myself using an infrared camera. The EEG device can actually measure your brain waves and is therefore ideal for measuring your sleep stages. Let's take a look at those results. Let's start by checking if the Amazfit GTR3 predicts the correct sleep stages at the right time. That is what is displayed here. On top we have the sleep stages according to the EEG device and on the left the sleep stages according to the Amazfit GTR3. Now each column here sums to 100%, meaning that we can see if the GTR3 predicted the correct sleep stages at the right time. 
I will highlight all the stages that are correctly predicted in green as I'm explaining the results. First of all, we see that only 23% of what was deep sleep was also correctly predicted as deep sleep. Most deep sleep was actually predicted as being either light sleep or REM sleep. Take this example night for instance, with deep sleep marked in purple. On top you see the sleep stages as they were recorded using the EEG device. On the horizontal axis we have the time of night and on the vertical axis we have the different sleep stages, that being deep sleep, light sleep, REM sleep and awake. On the bottom you can see a similar plot, but now for the sleep stages as they were recorded using the GTR3. Here we can see that the Amaze for GTR3 indeed detected some of my deep sleep, but it predicted a lot of extra deep sleep, and it also predicted a lot of REM sleep earlier in the night when I was actually in deep sleep. It is in general very unlikely I would have had this much REM sleep that early in the night. Light sleep on the other hand was predicted reasonably well, with about 61% of what was light sleep also correctly predicted as being light sleep. The rest of the light sleep was predicted as being deep sleep or REM sleep. Now REM sleep detection was also not very good. Only about a third of what was REM sleep was also correctly predicted as being REM sleep. Most REM sleep was actually predicted as being light sleep. If we look at REM sleep for this example night, marked here in red, we see that the REM sleep according to the GTR3 is more or less randomly distributed throughout the night. However, REM sleep should actually come in cycles, roughly evenly spaced apart, as you can see based on the data of the EEG headband on top. Now, awake detection was quite okay, with about three quarters of awake time correctly detected. If awake time was confused, it was mostly confused with light sleep. This makes sense as light sleep is the sleep stage closest to being awake. If we look at this example night with awake time marked here in green, we see that the longer awake moments were generally detected, however, the shorter ones were sometimes missed, as you can see for instance here. Additionally, an extra awake moment was detected right here. So how does the sleep tracking of the GTR3 compare to other devices? That's displayed here. Now this graph contains a lot of information, so let me try to explain what you see here. Along the horizontal axis, we have the average accuracy over the four individual sleep stages, that being deep sleep, light sleep, REM sleep, and awake. On the vertical axis, we have the accuracy of the worst sleep stage. I added this since many devices compromise the accuracy of one sleep stage to benefit the accuracy of the others. The better the device, the more to the top right it is. Now the best device would have 100% for both of these axes. As you can see based on these metrics, the best devices are different Fitbits, the Whoopstrap 3.0 and the Withing Sleep Analyzer. The Amaze for GTR2 is amongst the worst of the devices I've tested, as you can see on the bottom left right here. Now the GTR3 does not appear to be good at detecting the actual sleep stages. What it does appear to be reasonably good at is detecting my awake moments during the night and detecting the moment I fell asleep and the moment I woke up. So if you just want to check your total time asleep, the GTR3 might be good enough for you. Next let's take a look at oxygen saturation. In really simple terms, your oxygen saturation or SpO2 is the percentage of red blood cells in the bloodstream that contain oxygen. Normal ranges are generally between 95 and 100% and these are the values you should get at ground level. To test that, over the last week I took a total of 26 measurements of my SpO2 levels with both the GTR2 and a dedicated SpO2 monitor in the morning and in the evening. The results are displayed here. On the left are the values measured with the Amazfit GTR3 and on the right the values measured with the dedicated finger pulse oximeter. As you can see, the Amazfit GTR3 generally measured SpO2 values in roughly the same range as the finger pulse oximeter, which is pretty good. It does tend to record slightly lower values, but overall this is definitely not bad. What I also found interesting is that there was a correlation between the measurements of the finger pulse oximeter and those of the GTR3, and that is displayed here. Along the horizontal axis are the values according to the dedicated finger pulse oximeter and on the left are the values according to the GTR3. Each dot is a paired measurement between both devices and the blue line is the best fitting line through these points. It seems that even in this very small range of values, if the finger pulse oximeter measured a higher value, the GTR2 also tends to measure a higher value. Now the correlation isn't very big, but it is statistically significant. All in all, this is not bad, though I still need to test the GTR3 in a low oxygen environment. Next, let's briefly look at the GPS accuracy. While I was cycling, I also recorded my route using the Amaze for GTR3's built-in GPS. Now this is a first look and I'll record more data, however in this video I want to show you how well the GPS signal was acquired and how well it followed along with the roads I cycled on. Specifically I want to see how well it tracks my paths by cycling the same path two times and seeing how well the different paths overlap. Here you can see two rides where I took the exact same route from home to work. Now I didn't give the watch any extra time to acquire a signal as I initiated it immediately before I started to bike. And as you can see it acquired the signal really quickly. Now the two lines that indicate the tracking for the two different bike rides are pretty close together and they also follow the roads pretty well. Only occasionally do you see one deviating a bit more from the other and in this case even going through a building. However overall I would say it's not bad and there's only occasional moments where they deviate a bit more. 
So all in all, I'm not disappointed with the GPS tracking accuracy of the Amazfit GTR3. Overall, the GPS accuracy seems to be pretty good. The GTR3 acquired the signal really fast and tracked the path quite consistently for the most part. There were some moments where I deviated a bit more or showed some weird artifacts, but overall I'd say it's not bad, but you can judge yourself based on the data I showed you here. Also, I should note that on the iPhone, I did not give the app permission to use the GPS signal of the phone itself, but to make sure that it cannot piggyback onto my iPhone signal in future tests, I want to completely disable the GPS of my phone. Altogether, the Amazfit GTR3 did not improve as much over previous watches as I'd hoped. I'd heard that other YouTubers found the heart rate tracking to be much more accurate than previous generations. Admittedly, for me, it's slightly better than previous generations, however, it's still quite bad. So I would not recommend it for heart rate tracking based on my testing. The sleep staging was also not very good based on these first tests. However, just to track your total time asleep, it might be good enough. The SpO2 tracking and GPS tracking do appear to function quite well. So should you buy the Amazfit GTR3? Well, I cannot recommend it if you care about heart rate tracking during exercise and tracking your sleep stages. The watch itself is really beautiful and the SpO2 and GPS tracking appear to be decent. So if that is your main concern, you could consider buying it. However, if it was me, I would prefer the Mi Watch over the Amazfit GTR3. I think the Mi Watch is also really beautiful and the tracking is just overall better. If you care about sleep tracking in particular, you'll have seen my overview plot of the sleep tracking accuracy that there are much better sleep tracking devices out there like Fitbit, Whoop and the Withing Sleep Analyzer. Of course the Apple Watch is still the king of heart rate tracking if that is the thing you care about most. Be aware though that you need an iPhone to use it. If you want more content like this consider subscribing and you might also be interested in some of my other videos, for instance my video on the Mi Watch. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.